One of the biggest challenges when trying to model granular material flow is its ability to appear to pass through the regular phases of matter very easily. Those are solid, liquid, and gas. For example, if you look at the top section of the hourglass, you'll see that the grains are pretty much just sitting there. Just about all the grains you're looking at are not moving, apparently, at all. And that kind of resembles what we might think of as a solid, where the material is sort of locked in place. But closer to the bottom of the top section, we are getting close to the nozzle, you have to think that the grains are now starting to flow. And in fact, as they pass through the nozzle, they seem to be pouring much like we'd expect of a liquid. Then if you move to the bottom compartment, you'll see that when they land, the grains form something like a cone. What this is telling us is that the material can support its own weight a little bit differently than a standard liquid can. In fact, if you look at where the stream hits the top of the cone, you might be able to see that the grains are actually colliding and bouncing around a lot much like you'd expect in a gas. So lo and behold, in this one geometry, you're seeing what appears to be granular solid, liquid, and gas coexisting at the same time. Uh, granular materials are extremely ubiquitous. They're all over the place, and especially in industry, where they are second only to water as the most handled material type. Food industry, things like manipulating grains, corn, through silos, conveyors, hoppers, chutes. Pharmaceutical industry must deal with pills and powders on a daily basis. They lose millions of dollars in handling processes alone. You also have to think that granular materials compose simple geological materials, like, of course, sand, but also soil, dirt, gravel. Help us answer questions like, how does a landslide start? What's the flow like in a landslide? It has been estimated that we waste about 40% of the capacity of most industrial plants due to inefficiencies in handling granular materials. And because they are so common, they account for about 10% of the energy uh, consumed in the world. So we hope that in understanding how grains flow, we can start to optimize these processes better. Because for the most part, they've been based on rules of thumb, just empirical rules that have been passed down. Another important application would be applications involving traction. The Mars rover, Spirit, was intermittently stuck in the sand on a number of occasions for months at a time. May 1st, 2009, it got stuck in the sand for good. It is currently still stuck in the sand up on Mars. And it's interesting to think that such an expensive and well thought out operation could be foiled by sand, which is just so simple in our day to day lives. Existing continuum models for granular materials have sort of shot off from the way that we do continuum modeling of simpler materials like fluids or linearly elastic solids, where the idea kind of goes as follows. I think of a granular flow by imagining that the entire flow environment is split up into tiny little cubes, for example. And I try to figure out how the grains flow by doing a bunch of experiments on a single cube. When I'm done, I then apply the rule that I got from those experiments to all the cubes in the patchwork and let the material flow accordingly. This type of modeling can take you pretty far. But for granular materials, you, get, you run into some pitfalls. Unlike a fluid, for example, where the smallest part to the flow is something on the atomic scale, whereas the cup that you're trying to predict the flow in is extremely big in comparison, the grains themselves are small, but not all that small compared to the geometry you're trying to flow them through. For example, it's not uncommon to be able to look at the whole flow geometry and still make out the individual grains. As a result, you don't get quite a clean breakdown of this continuum argument like I just gave you. And in fact, the size of the grains start to have cascading effects. And you can think of it like the properties of one deforming cube are now influencing the other cube. The recent work that we've done has tried to factor the size of the grain itself into the continuum law. As a result, you can think of it like small little cubes or continuum elements are now sort of chattering with each other and influencing each other's deformation. And as a result, we were able to get much better results with flow.